This episode is made possible by listeners like you. Check us out on Venmo under the business accounts at Bigfoot UFO. All Things Unexplained. Hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. <laughs> CJ Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. Uh, I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. I just love that intro. <laughs> it's just so classic. Cajun Man. We owe him royalties or something, I'm sure. All right. Hello, everyone, all of our unexplained ones out there. I'm CJ Derringer, joined with my co-host tonight, Dr. Tim Mounts. And we also have a very special guest this evening, or it might be daytime when you're listening. We have Tom Medlin joining us on the show tonight. And we do have a very, very exciting night planned for you. We've had so much going on in the world of all things unexplained. And Tom Medlin is the man that we needed to get down to business here. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, while the rest of you were watching the Super Bowl a few weekends ago, we were having a Super Bowl of our own in terms of unidentified aerial phenomena. So while you were cheering on Patrick Mahomes, the next day, everybody was reaching out to Tom Medlin, trying to get his insight into what is going on in the world of uh, ufology, as we call it here. So he is the host of a podcast called Amateur Radio Roundtable, which we had the pleasure of joining last night. It was lovely. Everybody check it out. It's a great group of people and um, they do a live video feed every Tuesday night on w5kub.com and that's at 8 p.m. Central Time. And let me tell you, it's worth the tuning in just to see all of the gadgets that (laughs) Tom and all of his co-hosts have sitting behind them as well. They are um, ham radio I think they say amateurs, but I'm pretty sure they're experts and uh, really, really good stuff over there. So thanks again for having us. And thank you, Tom, for joining us on our show this evening. So welcome, Tom. Wow. It sounds like you have a lot of people there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm on the phone. You know, you know, we, we had a video. We were on video last night with you guys. And uh, I think that the reason we are not able to do video tonight, you guys have us blocked somehow because you found out I have a I have a face for radio. (laughs) (laughs) For TV, I have a face for radio. So anyway, hey, thank you, thank you so much for uh, having us on here. Man, I could talk uh, to you guys for like three days on this subject and still not cover it all. So uh, it's going to be jam packed tonight. I'll try to answer your questions. Uh, let me tell you a little about me real quick. Um, I'm, uh, I'm retired. Uh, I'm a uh, electronics engineer and, uh, let's see, a senior member of the, uh, Institute for Electrical and Electronic uh, Engineers. Uh, been a ham, uh, extra class ham now for about 59 years. And, uh, I, I've always been in the business of trying to design and build uh, equipment and new things. And, uh, I got into the Pico balloon hobby here all oh, four or five years ago, and it's been uh, really exciting. And uh, we've made some great improvements to how it was back then to how it is today. Wonderful. Well, and the ballooning is, is how we got in touch with you. Just a little teaser for what Tom is going to get into. We've done lots of podcasts in the past few weeks about these balloons that have been shot down by F-22s. It started with the Chinese spy balloon, uh, as we've been calling it. And then after that, there were three more that were shot down. And it came out that one of the balloons was actually potentially belonging to a Northern Illinois um, hobbyist club. They call themselves the Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Tom, you created, you built something that was part in that balloon, correct? 
Well, I, after talking with them more, I realized they did not fly one of the little tractors that we make. Uh, they they actually had a different one that they, they built up. But uh, we know the people. We've worked with them and tried to help them get on their feet. Uh, it, it's a little difficult when you try to send a balloon around the world. You know, the first balloon usually doesn't make it. And uh, the second usually doesn't make it. And you got to keep fine-tuning things, and uh, you'll eventually make it. Three years ago, you had to try 10 times before you get one around the world. Uh, now, we can just about guarantee uh, it will go around the world the first time. I mean, we've got it so fine-tuned. In fact, uh, I've got several balloons up right now. Uh, one we're very proud of. Uh, it, it's been up 252 days. It's flying at about 50,000 feet, and it's circled the, the uh, world uh, about 12 or 13 times now. Tell us, where are you located, Tom? I am in Carrierville, Tennessee. That's just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. So Tom's having, uh, he's been doing his podcast for 10 years, and we'll chat with you about that. But uh, you are having a little bit of your 15 minutes of fame because lots of people have been trying to contact you recently to get your insight on these balloons. In fact, you mentioned last night on your show that CNN had reached out to you and BBC and several others. And so we are honored to have you here with us tonight on All Things Unexplained. Thank you for giving us your time and joining us here this evening. So we'll just dive right into it. So tell us a little bit more about your podcast, your live show that you do every week. Well, it's mainly about ham radio or shortwave listening uh, and electronics. Uh, we uh, we started off uh, 60 years ago or maybe more just as a shortwave listener. And a lot of people are shortwave listeners today where you can take a little simple radio and you can listen to Radio Moscow or Havana, Cuba or anywhere in the world. And uh, that was really interesting. And I think that's what got us uh, involved in, uh, in ham radio. We got a license. And uh, it's been a great hobby ever since. I've been active uh, the entire 59 years. Uh, back in the olden days, we used to build all of our equipment. Uh, nowadays, you uh, just buy it, you know. Uh, there have been a lot of improvements over the uh, 60 years. So very briefly, for those of us, okay, me, that have no idea what ham radio is, because <laughs> I know Tim is very obsessed. What is ham radio? Well, ham radio is, is actually, it's a hobby, but we're also experimenters, and we're licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. A, a lot of people confuse ham radio with CB radio. Uh, ham radio is kind of like CB radio on steroids. Uh, on CB radio, you're limited to five watts. You're really not supposed to talk more than, I don't know, 12 miles or something like that, if it will go that far. Ham radio, we can run uh, upwards to 2,000 watts. We're licensed. We've got a tremendous amount of bandwidth of different ham radio bands that we can operate on. We can talk around the world. We can pick the band that's working for that part of the world at any given uh, part of the day. Uh, ham radio operators uh, can operate TV. We can send TV pictures back and forth to each other. We have a lot of digital modes. We have uh, sideband. We have AM. We've got Morse code. Now, Morse code is not a requirement anymore for ham radio to get your license, but a lot of us still do it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I operate what we call CW or, or Morse code. Uh, and, you know, just uh, so just flying these balloons, we actually uh, build this little micro transmitter. It's about the size of a postage stamp. We put it on this little balloon. This balloon is 32 inches in diameter, very small. And with uh, some calculations and a, a certain amount of gas measured to the tenth of a gram and uh, knowing the volume of the balloon and the weight of everything, we can actually place that balloon at a specific altitude and it will fly there. It will float at that altitude. So if we set it at 49,000 feet, it will fly at 49,000 feet around the world. This is, not a, uh, this is not a weather balloon and a weather balloon will not work. Uh, weather balloons are latex. They're made to go up high and stretch and pop and come down within a couple hours. Uh, we, we go for the long we go for the long haul, 252 days, and I, I hope we have 250 days more. That's phenomenal. What so are yeah, you collecting data with these balloons? Well, the main thing that, we, that our balloons send back, and we have public. And, and let me let me uh, just give out my website because if you go to my website, 
to w5kub.com. And if you'll click on balloon in the top menu, you will see a lot of our balloons on that page. You will also see maps of where these balloons are right now, and you can actually see them travel. And you can see some videos of us launching the balloons, building the balloons, gassing them up, and so forth. So there's a lot of information on, uh, on that website, w5kub.com. Click on balloon, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see more about Pico balloons. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're licensed by the Federal Communications Commission. We have been working with NOAA. You, you asked what type data we get. Uh, typically, for just our hobby, we just like to track them. We get things like uh, uh, latitude, longitude that plots on a Google map. We get things like the voltage of the solar panels. We get the altitude. We can get the speed. And we can even see a prediction on there where, where these balloons are probably going to go over the next 30 hours. Uh, so that's typically what we do. Now, NOAA, uh, NOAA is, uh, you probably uh, have seen their hurricane models on TV. You know, when a hurricane is coming up the yeah. coast and you turn the mm -hmm. news on, you see all the little dotted lines. And there are several different yeah. ones. Those are different models. You know, some of them stay together. Some of them kind of veer off. Yeah. We get the same model. We get the same model from NOAA uh, for our balloon flights. So oh, we can really? tell where these balloons are going to go. Yeah, we can tell where they're going to go. And uh, so that's a, a pretty neat thing. And NOAA is also collecting this data, what little bit of data we have now. And we can, we can improve the data and probably add a few more things. But NOAA is collecting this data and in, in using it to improve their prediction models. So NOAA is involved with us to some degree. Uh, and so, you know, I feel like we're helping people. So it's, 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 uh, it's scientific. It's a hobby. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing for like STEM, you know, your, your science, technology, and uh, electronics, math, you know, your STEM uh, programs in school uh, yes. where kids, kids uh, build this. They, they watch it. And, you know, uh, you just think about it. I mean, I have flown over countries where I didn't even remember studying or where they were. And you really learn geography, you know, as it goes over <laughs> countries. Uh, you, you learn, you, you watch it on the maps. No, oh, I'm over the city in this country, and, you know, and so forth as it, as it travels. So, you know, you learn a lot about the jet streams. We can, if we get up in the right jet stream, we can fly 150 miles an hour. Uh, or typically some of the speeds, slower speeds might be 10 miles an hour, but, uh, uh, you can you can see the weather jet jet streams. You you look at, and there there are websites out there that help us to see the weather at different altitudes. It shows us where the jet streams are and so forth, and we match that up to where we are. And uh, it's just it's just uh, it brings science together. It brings weather together. You know, it brings geography in. It brings uh, uh, electronic skills in. It just, it just brings a whole lot of things in, you know. Well, that was a sales pitch enough for me to go figure out how to send a balloon up and do it with my yeah. kids. <laughs> That's a great idea. Do you reach out to NOAA and connect with them? Or do they, like, how does NOAA get connected with your specific balloons? Well, uh, they have known about us. I'm not sure how they found out about us. But uh, oh, okay. we, 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 I, there, there are more people than just me, uh, you know, in the hobby. And uh, a lot of uh, there's other people that have actually had contact with them, and there's uh, been this arrangement or this uh, this uh, helping hand, you know, to, to uh, each other. Yeah, we're helping them, uh, you know. And, and again, we, uh, the tracking our balloons is on public websites, and if you look at my page, you'll see the public websites there, where you can see where these balloons. And there may be there may be at any given time uh, 50 or 60 of these ham radio pickup balloons floating around the world. And that doesn't, that doesn't uh, even take into account weather balloons. There are 900 locations that launch two times a day uh, weather balloons. So there's 1,800 weather balloons put in the air every day. Wow. And, and, you know, eight, now I'm talking a lot of balloons up in the air, 1,800 weather balloons a day by the National Weather Service. 
we probably had 50 or 60 balloons up, you know. And then, hey, think of this. Think of birthdays, 365 million people <laughs> in the U.S. <laughs> yes. you, you, you know, everybody has a birthday. You divide that by 365 days, and there's 1 million birthdays per day. Wow. And, and I can tell you, I can tell you, if 10% of those are kids, they're going to let a balloon go. So 1%, <laughs> I saw it happen just 1%, yeah, one percent of a million is a hundred thousand. No, I mean, uh, no, ten percent, ten percent of a, I mean, it's a hundred thousand balloons. So there's a lot of balloons up there now. The Chinese balloon that was bad; it needed to come down. They were spying, but there's so many other balloons up there that have yeah. been flying for forty years, fifty years, you know, over the, over a fifty year period, and they're heading. I don't think there's been one accident caused by a balloon it's a big place up there and we uh we fly we are actually we're flying under faa uh, uh 101 exemption meaning that the faa has given permission for for people if you meet this criteria on your balloon you're allowed to fly it without even contacting them and uh you know there's a few little things you have to do our, our uh, payloads have to be less than six pounds to qualify, and our tractors weigh about seven seven grams. Oh, That's less wow. than the weight of a quarter, you know, maybe a quarter. And uh, in, in the line, the string that it holds the little tractor, it has to break uh, within 50 pounds. So, you know, those are real simple things. Don't launch it at the end of a runway. You know, there's things like that. So yeah. the, the federal government, the FAA, has, has and is regulating these things. Now, Congress, they're jumping through hoops there. They think they can fix this thing, and I, I don't think they're looking through it right now, uh, right? And uh, yeah. they're threatening they are threatening to put all kinds of transponders and stuff on every balloon, but it can't be done. The transponder that, that they want to put on every balloon costs about $2,000, plus it's heavy. Our balloons wouldn't even lift it. So I, I'm not sure if Congress is going to be able to pass that or not. They need to just step back and talk to the FAA and say, FAA, do you have this under control? Have you done tests? Do you agree you got the right policy? And if so, I think Congress should not try to change or make their own laws uh, regulating these balloons. And I tell you, a kid loses a balloon, they're not going to put a $2,000 transponder on it. And, <laughs> and, and guess what? If they pass a law here in the U.S., uh, that doesn't affect other countries, and these hand blues are being locked in every other country. So, uh, and they come around across the United States. So, uh, you know, that's fascinating, Tom. I, yeah, tell you, yeah. I tell you what, I used I, as a former CBer, I really have an appreciation for ham radio, and a desire yeah. to pass the ham test. And they used to tell me that ham radio was the original internet. You know, back well, when. Well, you know, I yeah. The internet came out, it, the whole thing was, wow, you can communicate with anybody instantaneously on the other side of the world. And it was such a novel thing, right? Like, this had never been done before, but wait, it had been done before with ham radio. Yeah. I've, I've seen them say it was the first social network, you know, before everything yes. else came out. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And also, as a an avid doomsday prepper, <laughs> I have to admit that I'm fascinated by the potential for ham radio to come into service for the population should some sort of cataclysmic or emergency situation arise. You know, I mentioned I mentioned some of the different modes that we can run, like a ham TV, uh, sideband, uh, Morse code, digital. I, I failed to mention a couple others. Uh, we can do things like uh, EME, which is Earth, Moon, Earth. We can bounce, bounce the signal off the moon and talk to people through that way. Uh, we can talk with talk through satellites. We have a number of ham radio satellites that's circling the Earth right now, and even uh, we have radio gear on the International Space Station, uh, where uh, many of the astronauts uh, very quickly get their technician license so they can operate that radio. And we talk to we talk to the astronauts in the space station when they go over. Um, I, I, a good friend of mine is uh, uh, Colonel Doug Wheelock. He's an astronaut. He he's a, has a high-ranking position in uh, NASA now. A couple of years ago, he was the commander of the space station, and 
Uh, I talked to him 30 times one month uh, as they went over. And I even talked to him three times driving home in my truck. I was actually able to talk to the space station from my truck. Now, when they make a pass over, that's only up there for about, you know, seven minutes, eight minutes, nine minutes. But uh, it's still, there's so many different aspects of ham radio. That's incredible. Just mind-boggling. I had no idea that you could communicate with the space station. Just amazing. Tom, we have a listener Mm -hmm. question for you from listener George (laughs) Winters, a.k.a. Alabama George. He's a top fan of the show. You were talking about weather balloons, and he wants to know, I think this is a great question, considering we have so much advanced radar now, Doppler 9000, etc., he wants to know why does NOAA still use weather balloons? What do, what get data do they gather from those? Well, I'm not a meteorologist, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure I can give you a scientific answer to that. I do think there are things that the weather balloons can probably uh, uh, pick up and record that maybe radar uh, uh, won't uh, be able to pick up. You know, it's a big sky up there, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the radar uh, today, the re- I think the reason our balloons hadn't been seen in the past particularly is because the radar was, it was kind of closed, kind of narrow. And after the, they saw the big balloon, they, they said, let's see what else is up there. And they opened the aperture up on the radar, and then they started seeing everything like a bird, you know, which is too much to look at. Uh, let, let me talk a little about the, about the weather part of this. Uh, we just had a ham friend take a couple of our balloons down, and he went to Antarctica. He got a grant, a scientific grant, to go down to Antarctica to the German Niemeyer Station in Antarctica. And he launched about 11 Pico balloons uh, from Antarctica. And the study basically was to see how or what type of data we might get from these little Pico balloons that, you know, maybe cost you know, 40, 50 bucks and stay up for days and days and days at a time. How would that compare with launching a big expensive balloon with helium and, you know, expensive equipment hanging below it and so forth. So a study is going on right now uh, to see what we can do to help maybe reduce some of those weather balloons. Um, I, I, I can't tell you all the things, all the differences that might seem, but I'm sure there are many differences that, that uh, sensors in a balloon might could pick up that maybe the weather uh, radar would not. That's right. And George, I, it's my understanding that NOAA uses the weather balloons also to help them in forecasting future weather. So the ability to mm-hmm. detect certain things that can uh, allow them to make patterns and do the seven-day forecast, for example. Now that I know how many weather balloons go up every day, I, it makes more sense that every time there's some sort of UFO, people are like, it's a weather balloon. Well, sounds like there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> so maybe it is. There's a lot out there. Well, you had mentioned a few, yeah. You've mentioned a few really important key details that I want to circle back around to. Um, We have been, again, tracking this balloon situation for a couple of weeks now. And since Tim is so passionate about it, and trust me, I fear even doing this right now, but I'm going to have him give us just a brief, and Tim, I mean brief, synopsis. People can tune into our other podcasts to get the whole dish, but a brief synopsis of what has been going on with the balloons so we can circle back to Tom's details about the size of the ones that he launches, the weight, the FAA regulations, et cetera. Well, sure, just really brief. And of course, we feel like our listeners kind of know about this already, but we started, we had the spy balloon, right? Entered, went over uh, Alaska, Canada, across the continental United States. They say crossed a lot of sensitive military sites. We finally shot it down off the coast of the Carolinas, right? Then over Super Bowl weekend, and by the way, now we're all in arms in an uproar over balloons, you know, and UFOs. And then Super Bowl weekend, right, the most unprecedented once-in-a-lifetime situation starts happening. We start getting notices that our military... Is shooting down UFOs. Mind-blowing. Not since 1947. 
Roswell, New Mexico has headlines like that come out. And literally then, in 1947, the headlines were, flying saucer shot down. Next day, headlines were, whoops, it was a balloon. (laughs) (laughs) So, it's really funny how history has repeated itself now, all these years, decades later, 2023. And it started with a UFO over Alaska being shot down over Dead Horse or near Dead Horse, Alaska. And apparently out, you know, landed onto some frozen ocean. And I I can't wait to circle back with Tom later on that because he he said so many key details there, which, as far as I know, has not been in the public knowledge with this situation. Okay. The official search for that UFO that was taken down over Alaska, abandoned. Can't find any of the debris. The weather's too, too, and the terrain's too difficult. Search is abandoned. Next, we had a UFO taken down over, I believe Canada was next. Okay. There have been no details about that. And by the way, I believe they said that the Alaska balloon was, let's see here. Uh, yeah, that it was car sized. Originally, is what it's they said, and I'll circle back with this with Tom later. And and then over Canada, shot down, no further information on it. And then we shot down one over Lake Huron, it was described as smaller than the spy balloon. How could it not be? Because that thing was big as three school buses, it was octagon shaped with strings hanging off of it. So that search has been abandoned as well. For the UFO shot down over Lake Huron. And I basically feel like the news about the Northern Illinois bottle cap balloon brigades balloon disappearing over Alaska. That story came out and the Pentagon has shut it down. No other information. Almost as if they want us to believe that, yes, indeed, these were all hobby balloons that were taken out by missile. Our F-22s shot down things with very expensive missiles, and we were left to um, believe that nobody knew at the end of the day what it was. So, Tom, dive in a little bit here to this one that went over, that was shot down over Alaska and how it connects to this North Illinois bottle cap balloon brigade. Sure. All right. Uh, you know, I think the car size is a little bit uh, stretching it here. Our, our balloons are about... 32 inches in diameter, very small cylinders, uh, or spears, actually. Uh, there are some uh, Pico balloons out there that are more spherical shaped. They may be eight feet long and maybe uh, a couple of feet in diameter, look more like a, a cigar, you know, but uh, not many of those are flying. But, you know, uh, you know the, the, uh, the military or spokesman says uh, they can't find it. You know, the one in, I'm, I'm referring to the Yukon, you know. They say, you know, we're not going to claim it was a, a party balloon or a hobby balloon until we find it. Well, they're never going to find it, and I can tell you why. <clears throat> and if we were on video night, I was going to show you one of the balloons here. Uh, it is made, uh, the, the material is so thin, we have to be very careful handling it or it'll, it'll get a hole in it. It's uh, one mil thick that's one thousandth of an inch thick and um the little tractor that we built and the one flying was a little bit larger but the tractor we built again is postage stamp size now when that rocket exploded up there uh it probably vaporized that little balloon i mean there's no pieces that balloon's going to be found and probably even if the tractor didn't break apart you're never going to find a little one inch square thing down on the ground somewhere uh, out in the middle of the water or the snow or something, you know. Uh, and so how do we, why do we think that it's there? Well, as I said on the show last night, I, I'm 98% sure it was this ham radio balloon. And, you know, maybe 2%, it could have been an alien, you know, I don't know. But I think it was, <laughs> I think it was a ham balloon. And the reason, reason was <clears throat> where we were tracking it. In the last track we got, it was on the west coast of Alaska. And uh, uh, it got dark. And see, our, our pickle balloons don't transmit during the dark because they're solar power only. Oh. But but they continue on. They continue on. And when the sun comes up the next day, you know, it starts plotting again so we can see, you know, where it is. 
uh, and the NOAA prediction uh, for that flight uh, put it across Alaska and right exactly in the Yukon, right here between the two little cities where the military says they shot down, you know, this unidentified object. And we never heard from it again. So, you know, now it's not unusual for a balloon to just go down by itself or for some reason stop talking, but it's very, very much of a coincidence that yes. uh, it was right in the same area when a missile went off and we hadn't heard from it anymore, you know. Do you happen to know how long that balloon had been in the air? Uh, I think the balloon had been up about 60-something days. Okay. Yeah, I think it had been around the world about six times. So, you know, I, I really feel sorry for the kids up there that launched the thing. I mean, this this could have gotten many more revolutions around the Earth, and it was shot down on the sixth trip. It was doing so good. <laughs> but what a great story. <laughs> I know. What a bummer. I know. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking to Tom Medlin host of the Amateur Radio Roundtable podcast. You can check that out at w5kub.com. New episodes every Tuesday. And, wow, I'm just not sure what that says. And I'm not sure that inspires much confidence in our intelligence community, right? That we can literally log on to Tom's website and see where all their balloons are. And here we have our Pentagon and our military blasting, potentially blasting down a balloon over Alaska, over our airspace. And by the way, here's what I took away from Tom's analysis of the percent odds that it was the balloon versus alien. And my takeaway is, so he's saying there's a chance that it was aliens. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll take those odds. Can I ask you what color and shape are the Pico balloons? Yeah, uh, the one I was going to show you tonight, which we're starting to fly more and more, it's uh, it's actually clear. It's very clear. You almost can't see it. Um, so now the one that uh, they're all, they also make one that's uh, a, aluminum color or silver color, the 32 inches that's silver. That's what was flying uh, on the one over the Yukon that came down that we're missing. Now, that silver probably gives a much better radar uh, target than our clear ones. I think our clear balloons are pretty stealth, and probably uh, radar is just not going to pick those up. And the tracker is so small, again, I mean, it's smaller than, smaller than a hummingbird. I mean, it's just small. You know, I was, I was in the Air Force, but it's been a long time since I was in, so they don't listen to me anymore. But I was a little surprised when they when they said we shot this thing down, but we don't know what it was. That was just a real surprise to me. Usually you don't shoot things down if you don't know what they were. That one was silver. We've seen the clear ones. Tom, do you ever use any sort of odd shapes like octagons? No, I, I, I don't know of any Pico balloons that have used an octagon uh, balloon. But then again, you know, that, that could have been, that could have, it could very possibly have been a, a Mylar balloon that, you know, a d different purpose. I mean, you know, right. like they mentioned, it, it might have came from a car lot. Oh, yeah. You know, a used car lot or something. Or a Bucky's. Yeah. It could have been yeah, Bucky Beaver. Yeah, Bucky's. <laughs> it could have been Bucky's, man. Yeah. We've had a, yeah. some uh, All Things Unexplained trips to Bucky's, actually, in Tennessee. <laughs> And some yeah, good I times Bucky's. there. Yeah. Bucky's is oh, amazing, yeah. fantastic. Shout out to Bucky's. We're open to sponsorships, by the way. <laughs> Shout out to Bucky's. We've given you a fair amount of business. I'm just going to say that. Hey, that. Let me say one thing about Bucky. I'm just going to say one thing about Bucky's. If nobody knows what it is, the one in Tennessee, the one in Tennessee here that, that uh, he's talking about, we've stopped several times, it has 150 gas pumps. 150 gas pumps. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. People are big fans of Bucky's. I mean, truly, they have a following, a massive following. Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. Again, we're blatantly open to sponsorships, Bucky's, if you're out there <laughs> listening. You know, Tom, mm -hmm. I tell you what, we I really appreciate what you're doing with the ham radios and the Pico balloons and its benefit to young people and to the STEM, to the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics aspects of it. It's getting young folks and grown-ups alike off their screens 
and actually involved in something constructive and educational. It has a wonderful purpose and a wonderful mission. It also gets young folks and grown-ups alike interacting with each other and socializing, which these days is just priceless and invaluable. And I hope everybody will check out your podcast and your website and also check out Ham Radio and check out Pico Balloons as a hobby. But I appreciate you, Tom, letting us dig into some of these details with you. It's because in the in UFOlogy, there's especially a tendency from the government and from the Pentagon to just deal the public general non-specifics. And at this show, we firmly believe the devil's in the details, right? Like we've had countless guests tell us, you know, it's about the data. We ha- we can only move forward in what the truth is of UFOs with valid data. And, the, and there's only one way to find that out. And so I really appreciate you letting us dig into these details with you. Well, you're very welcome. And we enjoy being with you tonight. Yeah, we have a few listener questions that I would love to, okay. to send your way. And this is fun because I think the idea of building balloons, like you said, with kids and what have you, would, would be great. So our listener, Jason Stifler, wants to know how difficult it is to build a balloon and how long does it usually take to build? Okay, well, we actually don't build the balloon itself. We start. We we finally found some after years of, of hunting. The, the, oh, I, I need about two hours to explain the balloon, but I, I'm going to do it here in 30 <laughs> seconds. I'm going to do it in about 30 seconds. The, the Mylar, we started flying these Mylar party balloons. Mylar uh, it was the best material at the time because it wouldn't stretch. we got to have a balloon that doesn't stretch. You can't use uh, latex. You can't use a balloon, you know, like a party balloon that blows up and stretches uh, because what happens is as it goes up, the gas expands and the balloon gets mm-hmm. bigger. And it goes up and the gas expands. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it pops. That's the way a weather balloon works. And, in fact, a weather balloon is made to pop uh, like that. And a weather balloon lasts about three hours. Uh, hours, the material uh, the material is made not to stretch. Now, there's a certain amount of PSI. If you go over the PSI, it's going to pop. It's going to explode. And uh, so we know the pressure up there. We know the pressure we've got to, to get to to be safe. Uh, we put a, a very uh, a measured amount of uh, lift in the balloon. When a balloon leaves us here on the ground, it is almost empty because it's going to expand as it goes up. So this thing expands. It gets tight. Uh, the balloon fills completely out. It gets tight. But it's got to hold. It can't stretch anymore. If it stretches, it's going to go higher. Then if it stretches, then it goes even higher. So the balloon has to stop stretching. So based on the volume of the balloon, the weight of the payload, the amount of gas, that uh, the lift that we put in, <clears throat> we can determine how high it will it will go. <clears throat> as far as the tracker, you can buy. There are several people that are selling these little trackers that you can buy. In a roughly the $150 range, and uh, uh, you can attach that there and launch it, and uh, there it goes, and you can track it around the world. Now, we build our own trackers under a microscope. Uh, I was going to show you some little parts tonight on the end of the tweezer. It, it's uh, smaller than a gnat. Some of the parts are, are really, really small. But uh, we can actually build a tracker that will transmit 9,000 kilometers, that's uh, what, six, seven, eight thousand miles. And uh, it's easy to see on our maps. There's a, there's a map that shows the tracking. And you can see our balloons, it, it, let's say if it's over uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean, Ocean, you can see that it's being picked up in Australia and all over Europe and uh, maybe in Hong Kong and Japan. So you can see all the places in the world that this balloon is actually being picked up. They pick that data up and they put it in the internet. And then it goes to the tracking website and it plops on the map. So we can we can get a balloon in the air for, probably for about uh, forty forty dollars or so. And the balloons we're flying today are about twelve dollars, and uh, they're the best we have found. And uh, they're they're staying up a long time. They're they handle the pressure and they stay up. Great answer. You know, Tom, it was reported that the spy balloon took a drop of as much as 20,000 feet at one time. Listener George Winters wants to know, do balloons, your Pico balloons, typically drop 
20,000 feet all at once, or how about any altitude change at all? Well, you know, our pickle balloons, they can, but that means they've got a hole in them. And if they get a leak, they're going to come down. <laughs> you know, they're going to come down. Some come down a little slow. They leak out over days. Some come down fast. Uh, we've lost balloons in the deserts. We've lost them in the ocean. We've lost a lot of balloons in the, in the early days. Uh, no, we can't change altitude like that. We don't have anything to maneuver our balloon. It just goes with the wind. Uh, uh, atmospheric pressure will change the uh, altitude of a balloon. It may change it, you know, 500 feet, 700 feet. It may vary up and down, you know, so, say within 1,000 feet, you know, over time as it goes around the world. The uh, Chinese balloon, my understanding was the Chinese balloon had equipment in it that could actually... Uh, I think they had some propellers on it that we could probably even steer the direction. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's simple. It's simple to bring a balloon down 20,000 feet or take it back up. And what, what they may have inside there, and the government hadn't let me look, but inside the balloon, there could be another bladder or in, in there where if they just pump regular air into that bladder, the weight of that air will bring the balloon down. And then when they're ready to go back up, they just pump that air back out of that bladder. And, of course, the helium or whatever's in there is going to take the balloon back up. So they have equipment and a uh, sophisticated way of uh, uh, increasing or decreasing altitude. We don't. We fly the jet streams, and, uh, you know, it goes, it goes where the wind blows. So you might have missed that, but Tom said, the government hasn't let me look. And, you know, after your stories on your show last night... <laughs> <laughs> about the SWAT team yeah. coming to your house and yeah. all of the these people reaching out to you for your insight. I'm like, maybe the government would let him look. I can't tell if he's being facetious or not. <laughs> UFO Task Force is always looking for some new recruits. Some of that I think, sir, will stay for close second. Well, you know, I, I did have, hey, I did have a top secret security clearance when I got out of the Air Force for about a year afterwards, but then, you know, uh, it kind of goes away, so I guess they don't trust me. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we trust you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's dive in, Tim, to a little bit of analysis about what we think happened and why to be continued you've been listening to all things unexplained if you liked this podcast please do give us a five-star rating and leave us a review if you would like to hear more all things unexplained be sure to follow us wherever you listen to your podcast our show depends on the support of listeners like you find us on venmo under the business accounts at Bigfoot UFO. If you can't get enough of us, please check us out at allthings-unexplained.com. A special thanks to our producer, director, sound mixer, editor, and the man who wears far too many hats. No, seriously, he wears a lot of hats. Dr. Tim Mounts. Without you, we couldn't keep the lights on. Thanks for listening to All Things Unexplained.